Welcome, thank you for being here. I want to introduce Commissioner Randy Hartman. He's going to get us started tonight. Thank you all for attending. This was number five out of ten scheduled meetings for our Coastal Community Rehabilitation Program. And we want to thank you all for coming. It's a bit of a balmy night, so we appreciate you coming out in this inclement weather. Um, we welcome crowds from 130 to 325 people before, so this is one of the, our smaller crowds, but certainly it's important that all of you are here so that we can hear what our guest speakers have to say and that we can give you, get honest feedback from you, our residents and our constituents. So we thank you for coming tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss public safety with both the police and the fire chiefs. And our special guest is Ken Madison, the CEO for New Beach Hospital. So we thank you for coming. Um, I'll take just a moment to introduce um, our elected officials. I saw Jake earlier. There he is. Jake's in the back of the room. Thank you, Jake. Our city manager, Pam Bacosio, is here. Staff is here, so we want to recognize all of those. And then is anybody here from neighborhood council? Randy's here. Good to see you also. Um, they're kind of our feedback group for these sessions that are going to give us some, take, analyze all of our data and give us some back some uh, good information at the end of this whole program. So thank you all for coming. Uh, Anna has a few comments that she needs to make. So again, thank you. I'm Anna Hackett, I'm the public information officer for the city of New Smyrna Beach, and I wanted to let everybody know that you can find everything you need to know about the city on our website, which is www.cityofnsb.com. All the information for each of these sessions is available on our website under Coastal Community Resiliency. You can always contact the city, give us a call, we can direct you where to find the information. Um, wanted to let you know how our format's going to go tonight. We're going to hear from each of our gentlemen. You have on your table a green question card. While you're speaking, if you think of a question, something you want to ask, if you would kindly write it down. Kind of wave it. I'll be walking around. I'll grab your questions. And when all three of them are done speaking, um, we will go through your questions. If for some reason we don't get to your questions this evening, they will all be answered as we, <clears throat> excuse me, as we have done at each of these sessions, we keep our commitment um, to communicate with you, answer all of your questions. Um, just wanted to 
while I have the microphone, bring your attention to a couple of events coming up in the city, which are all on our calendar on our website. We've got food trucks coming up, and June 16th is our stroll through history for the 250th anniversary this year. And wanted to give a shout out to Phil Vesky. Phil, you want to raise your hand, please? Phil is rather new to the city. He's part of our staff. He is going to be our liaison with our neighborhood council. Uh, we'll be taking in all of the information that's coming in from citizens, translating that, working with the neighborhood council to work on our strategy, our action plan, um, as a result of these monthly meetings. So we're glad we're all here. Uh, we got a good program for you tonight, and I'll be looking for your questions. Thank you so much. First, I want to thank Anna. Anna always puts forth a great effort on, the, on these events. Um, and when it comes to information and getting information out to people, Anna's the go-to person. So anytime I want to get something out to the to the city as a whole, Anna's my, my go-to person. And I appreciate everything she does. Uh, I'm Sean Vandermark. I'm the fire chief here in New Smyrna. Uh, I've, been in, I've been working for New Smyrna for 20 years. And I've been blessed with having the opportunity to, to serve as the fire chief. Um, for the last six months. I appreciate every one of you coming out in this weather. I think this, this Coastal Community Resiliency Program, the entire 12 month series is an excellent opportunity for the people that we serve to be out there, to, to come to us, ask us questions, give us what their opinion is on things, and let us know how we're gonna shape the community. And that applies to everything, not just uh, transportation and development and economics, but even public safety. Uh, public safety does not operate in a vacuum. We do, when we are very responsive to the public and their expectations. So I really do appreciate you guys coming out here and taking the time to, to be part of this. Um, the New Smyrna Fire Department, your fire department, ran 5,600 calls last year. That's 5,600 calls for service of, of various types. 2,900 of those were EMS calls. Uh, they are calls for medical for medical care, things ranging from uh, minor ailments when people have maybe flu-like symptoms, all the way up to full cardiac arrest events and strokes, things of that nature. We also responded to 44 building fires in the last year, and 87 other type fires being car fires, wildfires, um, sheds, things like that. So that's what we've done in the past year, and that trend is slowly creeping up. We, have, we see an increased call volume annually, uh, probably in the range of four or five percent. But I'll, let me explain to you what the fire department in New Summer Beach does. It's not just a fire department, it is an all hazards department. We address all hazards that relate to the community. And we do this through a community risk analysis. And what we do is we go out there and we say, what are the hazards that the city's facing or could be facing. Now we cannot possibly plan for all eventualities, but we do look at what is most likely to affect the community, what can we do to get ahead of that and be ready for that incident before it even happens. And I think that's a very um, important approach to take as a fire service, to be responsive to the community and their, and their expectations. We cannot just exist as a fire department and, and properly serve you. We have to be more than that to you. We have to be able to respond to all of your needs. And, and we do that through this all hazard, all hazard approach, all hazard risk analysis that we do. Uh, I talked about 2,900 EMS calls that we had last year. Um, each and every one of those we treated as an advanced life support call. Each one of your fire engines that you guys see out on the street has a paramedic on it. What that means is that when that fire apparatus shows up at your house or your business, there is a paramedic, at least one, that is hopping off of that truck and they are able to render advanced life support care. That being they can administer oxygen to you, they can start IVs, they can administer fluid. Uh, we have a, a resume of 22 different medications inside of our, in, in our uh, protocol that we're allowed to administer to you. Um, and those range, from anything from uh, anaphylaxis or allergic reaction to cardiac care, cardiac arrest events, uh, stroke care, uh, heart attacks, all those things, we have paramedics who 
that is what they do as part of their role in the fire department, and that's to render advanced life support care. That is supplemented by EVAC Ambulance, uh, which is run by uh, Volusia County. Uh, and we are reliant on them, a large part, to transport people from the house or the business to the hospital. Um, there's been an increased occasion where we have had to step up and transport four EVAC ambulances when they were unable to. Last year, we uh, in two, uh, 2017, we did it 503 times. Um, EVAC wasn't able to come to the city of New Smyrna, so 503 times we had to step up and transport in their assets. Uh, so we do have the ability to do that. It's not our primary role, but it's definitely an important function that we have. And we have, when we talk about all hazard approach and, and analysis of the community, part of that is to say there are going to be times when the ambulance service that Blue County provides for us isn't going to be there. And that's when we can step up and provide that backup, that safety net for them. Another service that we offer to the community, and I think that this is a very important one for the community to, to help prepare themselves to take care of themselves. If we offer CPR and first aid classes, we will actually, all you have to do is hop on the uh, city, city website, cityofnsp.com, go to the fire department link, and there's a schedule of the uh, different classes that we offer, CPR, first aid being one, those two in particular, that really helps the community uh, prepare themselves to, to be the the first line of defense in getting medical treatment to people out there in the street. And so definitely take a look at that. We would love to have you guys come out and take a CPR course or first aid course. We'd love to get you guys trained up on those things. Uh, we also do a uh, smoke battery, um, smoke detector battery. We install those if you guys ever have these high voltage ceilings or you have a, a house where you just are not comfortable getting up on that ladder to install the smoke detector battery, give us a call. We'll be glad to come over. We'll be glad to uh, take your batteries and put them in for you. We're not, that, that, we do that all the time. It's, it's not a rare occurrence for us. Um, two ways you can make that happen. Number one, you can get on the city website again and send a request to us, or you can call the uh, main office. The phone number is on the website. Uh, we also do uh, participate in the New Smyrna Beach High School Medical Academy. Now, for those of you who have grandkids or, or sons and daughters that are in the New Smyrna Beach High School, if they have any interest in going into the medical field, and I'm not just referring to emergency medicine, I'm talking about any kind of medical field, New Smyrna Beach High School has a medical academy. And where we come into that program is we actually take the students that are involved in the medical academy, and they go on ride along with the fire department. So if any of your children or grandchildren have interest in the medical field and they're interested in getting into that medical academy, uh, look it up, check it out. We bring them in, they hop on the fire truck with us and they run calls, they run and they see the things that the emergency services does. Another uh, service that we offer to help the community better prepare or be prepared for things that may come are uh, business inspections, building business inspections. We, we take a look at the, the business and we assess to figure out is there something here that we can improve can we make your business safer there is uh, FEMA came out with a study that said 40% of businesses that are struck with disaster will never reopen and of those that do reopen 25% will fail in the first year so that's significant and that's where we and the business inspection program kind of come in and, and kind of try to help the community uh, be better prepared and be proactive in fixing these problems before they before they crop up. We come in and we find uh, electrical faulty wiring problems, we find extension cords that shouldn't be there. Uh, none of these things are, are a mechanism for us to go in there and harass the business owner. We really, we want to keep the business open and we don't want them to be impacted by disaster or fire. Uh, obviously, that has a ca if a business closes down, it has a cascading effect on the community. All the businesses around there feel the absence of the building. You have a building sitting there vacant because the business has gone under. Um, that and that trip that cascades out to the surrounding community. And we, as a as a service to the community, don't want that. So we like to go into the business ahead of time, find the the issues or the potential issues, and actually. Uh, 
help eliminate them. We're not, we are not there to uh, badger the business owner. We're there to help them, and we really want them to stay in business. We really do. Um, when you talk about community risk reduction, it is a program where we go out into the community and we look, and we say, what is the best way that, that we can impact, impact and not and take away the risk or minimize the risk that, that either the business or the individual are facing. Um, when our fire department crews go out into homes and look and, and help people, whether it's a medical problem, slip and fall, things of that nature, all of our crews are looking at and they're looking around the house and trying to find um, issues, small issues. If we go to a, a particular person's house several times for slip and fall, we're there and we're looking around to try to figure out, uh, play detective a little bit, figure out what is the real underlying problem. And we, we'd rather fix all the issues because we don't want anybody getting injured. So we would rather be proactive, fix the issues that are causing the slip and fall, fix the issues that are causing the uh, recurring uh, 911 calls, and kind of try to get ahead of that. Because obviously that's, um, that's our main goal, is not, to be res not to respond to the call, it's to prevent the call before it happens. And if we can do that, then I feel like we've actually accomplished something uh, greater than just responding to the call. Um, obviously, it, it, hurricane season's been, uh, it's fast approaching. Uh, there's, some, there's a lot of talk about an active hurricane season. Uh, so those of you who don't have a preparedness plan, I would highly encourage you to, to get on it. FEMA actually has an app, an app on, on your uh, smartphone. You can download that. That can help you develop a plan. Uh, if you're developing a plan when the storm is approaching, it's too late. And I know you guys have seen the rush at the, at the Home Depot or the Publix or, the, or wherever of, of bottled water that is flying off the shelf. If your plan is to wait for that hurricane to, to get closer before you decide to to take action on your plan, you're, you're too late for that already. So get ahead of the game. Get Download the FEMA app on your phone. It'll walk you through everything you need to get it, to get prepared, and it may, you, know, you can be sure that you are fully covered with that. Another issue that we run into a lot with hurricanes is people who either run out of medication or run out of oxygen. This is a big one. Uh, any, any of your family members that you may know that are on constant oxygen, when the power goes out, their oxygen generator can't produce anymore. Um, so it goes to the backup system. Well, the backup system is a cylinder of oxygen, and it can it cannot sustain for more than more than a day. So if a storm's approaching, part of their preparedness plan would be to actually have more oxygen bottles delivered, because that's the only way that oxygen is going to work for them. So if you have family members, take a look at that. Um, and lastly, before I pass it off to Tim, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about where we're going as a fire department. Like I told you earlier, we, we, can't, we can't just respond to fires, and we can't just respond to email calls like we have always done. We have to have a plan, and, and we're developing that plan. I'm going to be surveying the community. I'm going to be sending stuff out, either via uh, the internet or via mail, mailers. And I'm going to survey the community, find out what their expectations of the fire department are. And we're going to take some of that feedback, we're going to get a couple of uh, groups together, and we're actually going to develop a five-year strategic plan for the department. We're going to have a plan that talks about how do we address things that are happening out west of uh, New Smyrna Beach. How are we going to address areas where things are starting to become more crowded, how, is, how traffic is beginning to and have a, we're going to go ahead and address the, the response model for the entire city of New Smyrna Beach. And a lot of the, with a lot of the stuff that's going on west, we need to address that. So in part of our five-year plan, we are going to be looking at changing our model, changing our model to fit the needs of the community better, to be more efficient, to be faster and lighter. Because obviously these big fire trucks you see driving around town are not the fastest, lightest way to deliver care. And so we are going to be looking at faster, more nimble, efficient ways to deliver those services to the community. 
So I look forward to talking to you guys either through these cards or through uh, maybe afterwards. And uh, I'm just now going to pass it off to Ken Mattinson from Florida Hospital. Ms. Mom. Thank you very much. It is a privilege for me to be here this evening. And I gotta tell you, to be included with the fire department and the police department, it's an honor. It's an honor. And I appreciate you guys having my back so that if, if I say something that's inappropriate, they'll stand up and say, I believe what Mr. Madison meant to say was, and then they'll help fix it. So you're on deck. When we get together to talk about public safety, you might think that the CEO of the local hospital is going to stand up and talk about some traditional public safety issues. Like, for example, our security guards, thanks to the help from our local police department, now carry radios and they're able to be in contact directly with the police department. I think that's an extraordinary advancement in communication between important agencies. You might expect me to talk about that. Or you might expect me to talk about the fact that the hospital has served as an emergency shelter in past hurricanes. Steve Harrell and I gave him credit for this a long time ran that hospital and never once evacuated because of a hurricane. We have had two hurricanes since I've been there as the CEO, and I've evacuated during both of them. And people say, you must not be much of a hospital administrator, because Steve Harrell never had to evacuate the hospital. So I, I think I need to defend myself just a little bit. I don't know if you all know this, but the generator, the emergency generators at the hospital are at 11 feet above sea level. And so when I hear that there is storm surge predicted that gets close to that 11 feet or exceeds that, I don't feel safe in saying to the community, yeah, we'll write it out. I, I've never been worried about the building blowing away but I have worried about losing power and then having our generators flushing. So because storm surge was predicted during the last two hurricanes that we evacuated for, it was predicted to be at or above that 11 feet. That's why we made the decision to evacuate. And candidly, I'll do it again because there's nothing more important to me than the safety of the people that we have the privilege of taking care of. So you might expect me to have talked about that as kind of a traditional public safety issue, right? Um, and yet, there are some other important, I believe, public safety issues that I want you to be aware of. Each month, we do what's known as a clinical close. A clinical close is similar to a financial close in that we evaluate all of the metrics that relate to the clinical care that we're providing. So for example, we monitor response time in the emergency room. We monitor, it's like a seven page document with small, it's an amazing process, similar to a financial close. But it's a clinical close that helps us monitor the safety and the quality of the care that we provide. I believe that one of the most important metrics that we monitor, and forgive me for, for bringing it up, but it's mortality. I don't think there's a more important safety metric to look at than how many patients died when they were within your care. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but every patient that is provided care in an inpatient setting 
is placed in one of almost a thousand diagnostic related groupings. They're called DRGs. And those DRGs are helped to define the level of care that that particular patient needs. It just so happens that every one of those DRGs has a predicted mortality associated with it. So when you come into the hospital and you come in, I know you're not admitted for, for hangnails, but if you're admitted with a hangnail, the predicted mortality for a hangnail is like zero. But if you're admitted to the hospital for a cardiac event, a heart attack, the predicted mortality for that is going to be a lot higher. And so we have what's known as the expected mortality calculated for every patient that we see. And we do a ratio. How many patients, based on that predicted mortality, how many patients actually died? We call that observed mortality compared to expected mortality. Am I getting too technical here? Good, hang with me because it's important. You want that ratio to be less than one. If you're at one, expected mortality compared to observed mortality, you're average. I'm here to tell you that over the last six months, our mortality index at Florida Hospital New Smyrna was 0.86. And the last quarter, we're at 0.7. Continuing to beat the odds as it relates to expected mortality. That to me is a public safety issue. That's something that candidly doesn't get broadcast much, but I'm proud to tell you that your hospital is doing better on mortality than what is expected by a significant amount. Is that important public safety? I think so. When I was asked to come and talk to you today, I started thinking, you know, what can I share? Some practical issues that I want to make sure you take away is I don't think that we as a society wash our hands enough. I know it's something that I battle every day in the hospital because infection management, infection control, infection prevention is a critical aspect. Should I be standing farther away from the window? <laughs> infection prevention is a critical part of how we keep people safe. And yet I don't believe that as a society we place enough emphasis on washing our hands. So from a public safety perspective, let me encourage you wash your hands and if i happen to be at walmart and see you coming out of the bathroom and you didn't wash your hands i'll probably say something to you and the police will come arrest me because there's been an altercation at walmart the ceo of the hospital uh, wash your hands it's an important public safety issue so looking online medical news today gave me the leading causes of death in the united states today you might think I'm kind of hung up on this death thing, but those are the, the ultimate measure of quality, of safety. Are you curious what those are? Heart disease, 23.4% of all deaths are related to some kind of a cardiac event. Cancer, 22.5%. Chronic lower, lower respiratory disease, the percentages drop way off at this point. That was a surprise to me, 5.6%. Accidents, 5.2%. Stroke, 5.1%. Alzheimer's, 3.6%. Diabetes, 2.9%. Influenza, 2.1%. Kidney disease, 1.8%. Suicide, 1.6%. Those are the leading, leading causes of death in our society. And so I thought I'd take the top five and talk to you tonight about what we're doing at our hospital, at your hospital, to focus on what can we do about those five leading, top leading causes of death. Heart disease. 
<laughs> I wonder what it's like about lightning strikes. I'm really sure. Go online and look at it. You're more likely to be struck by lightning. We have some, some amazing cardiologists that live in our community and serve our community. They have demanded over time that we provide state-of-the-art cardiac services at the hospital. I don't know if you knew this or not, but we have some of the most amazing cardiac cath facilities of many places around. I, I, I'm proud of that because for me, when and if I have my heart attack, I want to make sure that my hospital is able to care for me. Cardiac cath facilities, state of the art. And we're also part of a system of care that should I need open heart surgery, it's close by. And we have arrangements to help make sure that that happens. I would encourage you, just like the fire chief shared with you, have a plan for hurricane preparedness before. You probably need to study the the symptoms of a heart attack so that you're getting care sooner rather than later. Because you do have a part to play in the provision of care. And if you're ignoring it, if you're saying, it's not happening to me, that could contribute to your demise. Cancer care. Lung cancer is the number one cancer between both men and women. And candidly, what I read about cancer <coughs> is that much of it can be prevented with lifestyle changes. I've heard that as high as 75% of the chronic diseases that we treat in this country is because of choices, health choices that we have made. And so from a public safety perspective, I would encourage you to take control of your cancer risk. Learn what you can do about preventing it, and then actively pursue that. We enjoy a partnership with Halifax Health. That was a relationship that existed before the merger back in 2016. And through 2020, that partnership for providing cancer care will continue. And I have their commitment that they're going to continue to work diligently with us to make sure that our cancer program is the best that it can be. But some things that we're focused on in our cancer program right now to improve it is we are preparing for accreditation through a program called Commission on Cancer. It's a pretty rigorous process, and candidly, it's one that if we indeed score well on a survey from the Commission on Cancer, we'll have a better program. So getting ready for that accreditation survey is an important way of us improving care. I am also clear that navigating the care for cancer is very complicated, and I can only imagine that person that this latest visit to their doctor, the doctor says, you know what, that dreaded C word is something you're going to have to contend with. How do we help our family, our community, navigate the complexities of cancer care? We've added something called a nurse navigator at Florida Hospital New Smyrna. Their sole responsibility is to help our patients navigate those complexities. If you want a second opinion, we'll try and help you get that. We're focused on helping to navigate. There's also a multidisciplinary team approach to the care that we're providing. We find that better decisions for care happen when a team approach is taken. And there's a multiple, multi, I keep stumbling on that, a multidisciplinary tumor conference 
that is held regularly at the hospital where each cancer case is reviewed. And then candidly, because whole person care is important, palliative care, it may be inevitable that the patient is gonna die. We've gotta make sure that we're providing comfort care and a palliative care environment that is important to our comprehensive cancer program. Chronic lower respiratory disease down to 5.6%. What I will tell you is we have a very robust cardiac and pulmonary rehab department at the hospital. We've got an amazing group of uh, board certified pulmonologists, Dr. Zailani, DeBello, and Zachris. They do an amazing job. Um, I don't have a specific program at the hospital built around that particular disease category, but I know that we see a lot of it and we care for it. When we talk about accidents, the fourth leading cause of death in this country, I would be remiss if I told you that not wearing a seatbelt, today you probably can't get away with it because your car is gonna remind you or annoy the heck out of you if you don't put your seatbelt on. But there's something else that we're doing as a society, ladies and gentlemen, that I want to encourage you to be mindful of. And that is distracted driving because of texting that's going on. I wish we could get the word out to more people and convince more people kills people and I would like to encourage you to help me take that word to the rest of the community our emergency room needs to be ready to care for patients when they have experienced an accident I'm proud to tell you that over the last two years we have been working on improving not only the safety and the quality of what we do in our emergency room but also the patient satisfaction. Our team has taken this on, and I will tell you today, we are ranking higher than any other hospital in our region in patient satisfaction for our emergency room. We're a top quartile performing hospital. That's at the 75, 75th percentile or higher, and that's our commitment. We continue to strive to make sure that that happens. You've probably noticed there's quite a bit of renovation going on. We're in the process of renovating our emergency room. It hasn't quite started. You're probably noticing it up on the floors. If you've been there, fourth and third floor are done. We're working on the third floor. We've done the Schildecker lobby. The tower lobby's done. I'm kind of proud of the new look that's going on. I wish I could build a brand new hospital right away, but we're probably going to have to outgrow this hospital before we, we do that. But the emergency room is really the front door of the hospital. And in addition to focusing on remodeling that, making it look better, we're also focused on what we can do to, I believe, redesign the care that's provided. Traditionally, when you show up in the emergency room, we have 19 gurneys, beds, that we can place you in. If all 19 of those are full of people, whether they have a runny nose or whether they're having a cardiac event, our capacity and yet candidly we find that we're putting horizontal many patients that don't need to be horizontal for their emergency care so care initiation can occur much quickly much more quickly if we redesign the care to not wait for the bed and we're in the process of redesigning it and we're incorporating what's known as a results waiting area we can expand capacity and improve throughput by allowing those patients that don't need to be horizontal, we'll place them in a comfortable chair while we wait for the results of imaging or lab, and in the process improve those that are waiting for that bed. That's what we're doing right now. It helps us improve the fast track component to what we're doing. Paramedics are now part of the, the team that we have in the emergency room at Florida Hospital New Smyrna. They, along with the nurses, do a good job of helping us evaluate care as well as provide care. 
something else, and, and, and I don't know why it took us so long to figure this out. The whole idea of a leader rounding on a patient is something that has kind of been foreign to healthcare. But we've decided that if the manager or the director of that department spends more time visiting with the patients that are within our care, they're going to learn what's working well and what isn't. And so it's a simple solution, but we're getting extraordinary feedback from patients who are telling us what we're doing right as well as what opportunities we have. So leader visits of patients, in my mind, is an important improvement protocol. And then if you've been in the hospital recently, you've probably heard overhead pages, code sepsis, code STEMI, and stroke alert are now being paged when patients show up in our emergency room because every time one of those is paged, team members from all over the hospital know what their job is and they can go and get involved in that particular episode of care and improve it. She's coming to take my mic from me, isn't she? <laughs> I'm almost done. That's what we're focusing on in our emergency room. The last of the five that I wanted to talk about this evening is stroke. 5.1% of all deaths are brought about because of stroke. Every year, the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association evaluate emergency departments and hospitals based on how well they are adhering to the guidelines that they put forth that are evidence-based medicine. And then they give awards. I think their awards are a bit complicated. Please don't tell them I said this. But I'm proud to tell you that Florida Hospital New Smyrna, your hospital, my hospital, achieved the highest award with the American Stroke Association. The award goes like this, Gold Plus, Target Stroke Honor Roll Elite Plus. Got it? You see why I think it's a little too complicated? It's the best of the best. And what the gold stands for is that we've sustained that over the last two years. The target stroke honor roll elite plus focuses on the metrics, how long did it take us from the time the patient walked through our door until and they were diagnosed with a stroke until they received the life-saving or the, the brain cell saving medication the thrombolytics, the TPA. The standard is 60 minutes. Your hospital is doing it in 43 minutes. I am so proud of the team of men and women that work at Florida Hospital New Smyrna and for their dedication to honoring God through the care we provide our community. And I want to thank you for this opportunity you've given me of bragging a little bit on it. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Coffin. I'm the Chief of Police here in New Smyrna Beach. Um, it's very difficult to follow uh, heart attack, stroke, cancer, and death, so I'm going to give it my best shot. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to take a bunch of time up here just talking because um, I'm not going to go through statistics or the other things that you think I would talk about. I want to talk about the strategic level, the 50,000 foot level of how we do business in the police department. What I really want to do is hear from y'all. And before we get to that, I want to uh, thank Mark Severance. Mark, please stand up. Mark is uh, my operations lieutenant, and uh, tonight he and Thomas Cook. Thomas, stand up. Thomas Cook, our IT director here in the city. Um, we've 
a bigger crowd here tonight, but I imagine that we got quite a larger crowd on social media. Uh, Thomas has made uh, this happen. Uh, we're being watched on YouTube, and Mark is doing our Facebook Live. This will be the first time at CCR where we've actually had an interactive ability of people asking questions on Facebook Live. So thank you guys for doing that, and to our folks out there in uh, virtual land, welcome. So when I got back here, and when I got here in 2015, about the same time when I got here, there was a presidential task force that had been assembled in Washington, D.C., and they were discussing 21st century policing. This task force was headed by former Washington, D.C. police chief and current Philadelphia police chief Charles Ramsey, uh, very well known in law enforcement circles as, as a, a top administrator in law enforcement. And he and his task force set about to identify what a police agency in the 21st century should look like. I'm a big fan of uh, Chief Ramsey, so I very closely monitored what they did and what they came up with. And what they presented um, was uh, six recommendations, they call them actually called pillars, uh, of how policing can promote effective crime reduction while building public trust. Very important, two things. Effective crime reduction and building public trust. Those six pillars are what we model our agency after. It is at the absolute strategic level of what we try to accomplish. And your police department here in New Smyrna has taken those six pillars and the various recommendations, and there's anywhere from three to eight recommendations under every one of those pillars, and we've implemented almost everything here. Those six pillars are building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, uh, community policing and crime reduction, training and education, and officer wellness and safety. So we took that as a, as a baseline, as a building block to build this agency to what it is today. And I'll talk specifically about one of those, which is community policing and crime reduction. Take a look around. There are multiple police officers in this room. I've been doing this 31 years, so I kind of know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. There are not any better trained, better equipped, and better attitudes that come to work in this city every day than the people you see sitting all around here. They do an outstanding job, and I'm here proud of them. One particular area where we, we do very good work, I think, and I'm going to recognize one particular individual in a minute. When, when we're dealing with, with calls for service and everything else that we deal with out there, we continually find that we're dealing with the same people. Most people in New Smyrna and the surrounding areas are good people. They do what they're supposed to do. They come to work, they go home, they don't get into trouble, maybe speed or don't wear their seatbelt a little bit. <laughs> but they're good people. We're dealing with the criminal element out there. There's a very small number of people out there and we're continually dealing with the same people. We're dealing with prolific and serious offenders all the time. You ask any one of these detectives that are sitting out here right now, they know who all the burglars are because it's the same ones all the time. So we employ an intelligence-led policing program here in New Smyrna that I will tell you is better than anything I've ever seen. Um, I charged a couple of people sitting in this room to, you know, I give them a framework of, of what intelligence-led policing should look like. And basically, it is gathering information and developing an analysis. And this isn't done by just uh, technology. You know, we don't plug in things into a computer and spits the answer back out to us. These are people who know the city, who dig down into this information, make connections, and then produce intelligence products that go out on a daily basis and sometimes multiple times a day to the officers in the field. So as administrators, what we're able to do is we're able to deploy our resources, our limited resources, to focus on what's important. And we'll, what we've deemed important here in this, in this city are the things we can have control over. Burglary, theft, motor vehicle theft, homeless crime. These are the things that matter to what, what I've heard from the, the public really matters to people. So we do this on a daily basis, and these products help our officers know what to look for, know what to look for, know who to look for. 
And then that in turn, they give that information back to our intelligence led policing component, and that product is updated constantly. So I told you I was going to tell, tell you about one of my folks. So Sergeant Chris Kirk, who supervises our detective unit, does a fabulous job. <laughs> and Detective Nikki Diff, they stand up next. This is really the, the bulk of this work is done by two people. Our prime analyst, Christine Lee, who's not here right now, and Nikki did it. And Nikki does an amazing job of putting together one of the best intelligence products I've ever seen in all my years of doing police work. So much so that I'm very proud to announce that we just found out that she is being awarded as the uh, individual for outstanding service in the field of law enforcement by the Veterans of Foreign Wars. She will be receiving the Public Servant Award for the state of Florida. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is the caliber of person that is working here in New Smyrna for you and me. And I can't tell you how proud I am of to have people of Nikki's caliber and everybody else is sitting in this room because they care about what happens here and they work hard to make sure that you and I are safe. So with that, I'm not gonna ramble on because I know y'all have a bunch of questions and I really wanna hear from y'all. So Anna, it's up to you. I gotta go wash my hands. <laughs> So there's quite a few that can go, probably 10 in one view, so I try to, I try to mix them up a little bit. Um, and to address our Facebook question first, what is the average life of a smoke detector? All right, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, smoke detectors, as they're designed, uh, will, a typical smoke detector, la the lifespan is about 10 years. That does not mean that the battery inside there is worth, it will last for 10 years. Uh, it's, a new, it's a new concept, they're actually putting lithium batteries in smoke detectors now that will last the entire 10 years. But if the question towards Facebook, if the question is actually how long does the physical plastic thing that's hanging on your ceiling, uh, how long does it last for? It's, it, it's lifespan is 10 years. If it is driven by a 9 volt battery or a replaceable battery, that should be done every six months. So every time you change your clocks, you change your clock forward or back, spring and fall, that's when you change your battery. Change your clock, change your battery, uh, and every 10 years, you should replace the actual physical uh, plastic smoke detector as an entire unit. There was another question in here. Somebody had asked, "Does it is there a fee for to come change a?" No, not at all. The uh, the smoke detector service that we offer, uh, if you need us to come install these batteries, we are more than happy to do it. There is no fee for that. Uh, all that we ask is that you uh, make sure you know how many we're talking about and, and make sure you have the proper batteries when we get there to go ahead and swap them out. And typically the batteries that are there are 9 volt batteries in most cases. Uh, if they're not, then we may, have, we may have to make a return trip. Not a big deal. We'd be more than happy to do it. Uh, just let us know either by phone or on the uh, website. Okay, you can take this first because uh, it's for both fire and police. Uh, the average duration of employment Okay. Uh, in, inside the fire department, our average duration of employment is 25 years. Uh, at about the 25 year mark, you've been doing the physical work that these men and women are employed in. I think 25 years is about, your, about what your body can handle. Uh, we have guys that extend a little bit beyond that, but about 25 years is about where we start to see people uh, decide to retire and, and, and take off. I think he just called me old. <laughs> I've been doing this 31 years. I think I'm going to stick around a while. Uh, I don't know what the average is in, in the police department. I mean, I think most folks um, go to their retirement date, which is 20 years. Some go a little bit old, uh, you know, over that, but I think for the most part, 20 years. For the hospital, how is the hospital improving on infection rates? Has the rate gone down? Yes. <laughs> is there an answer to the how? The how is a lot of 
diligent work. Frankly, the way that we clean patient rooms, the way that we clean the hospital, I don't know about you, but I don't know how carpet in a hospital hallway works. And so I am really pleased to see that all of the carpet on the third and fourth floor has been removed and we've replaced that with plank vinyl that is hospital grade that you can clean with the right chemicals and I believe that that helps improve. But candidly, we're finding that the biggest impact after you do all those other technical issues is what I shared with you and that's wash your hands. And that's the message I carry with my staff every day. Thank you. <laughs> How many drug overdoses have you been to? Or be specific. So, do all three of you deal with that? <laughs> the fire, was it fire? Yeah, in the fire and EMS realm, uh, it's going to be really hard for me to say the number of uh, uh, overdose incidents we've had. I know there is a marked increase in overdoses. Um, it's not, when I say last year we had a 5% increase in our call volume, that's a, a, seems like a very small number. When we're talking about drug overdoses, we are talking nationwide even, we're talking in the realm of a 20 to 25% increase in drug overdoses per year. So that, um, and that comes from GIPS. So there's a, a Journal of Emergency Medical Services and some of their numbers are in the, are up as high as that. So it is an epidemic. I think everyone recognizes that there's actually state, um, new state laws that require physicians to go through a whole different thing when they start to prescribe opiates, limiting the number of days they can prescribe opiate, opiates. Um, and then if they go to extend beyond the three days, when they get to the seven day mark, there's a whole nother realm that physicians have to go through, more steps they have to go through. And that was passed very recently, actually, in the state to prevent the overuse of uh, opi opi opioids excuse me, and the uh, possibility of overdoses. Thank you. One for the police chief. <laughs> what can the city do about the boats we see anchored in the ICW? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have a program going on right now uh, where we're removing some derelict vessels uh, in and around New Samar. Uh, we're working with our partners in the Florida Wildlife Commission uh, to with, through a grant to have some of these derelict vessels removed. There's a very specific criteria for derelict vessels. Um, most of the ones that have been here, and, and if you know this area very well over here on Chicken Island, there were uh, a couple of boats that were washed up on the beach. Uh, we just removed those. Uh, we've removed a total of seven that I'm aware of so far, and we're working on a couple others. So if we're talking about derelict vessels, uh, that's the process in which we do that. Now, as you know, at the state level, things always move a little slower than they do at the local level. So this is taking quite a bit of time, uh, but we're still in, in the process of, of doing that. Um, as far as other vessels around here, I mean, you know, these are public waterways. Uh, we believe that people have the, the right to use them. So as long as they're uh, not doing anything they shouldn't be doing, um, they're good to go. Thank you. Uh, what plan for the hospital? What plan do you have to help prevent cardiac and cancer in our community? You know, I, I, I'm glad that question came up because I intended to talk a little bit more about it, and I kind of scared myself because I was going way over my time. Um, improving the health status of the community that we serve is an important part of us fulfilling our mission. And we've got to recognize that the next phase of healthcare, the next iteration of how we manage healthcare, because today, if we keep doing what we're currently doing, we don't have enough money in the U.S. coffers to handle all of the chronic diseases that us baby boomers are suffering with today. And so we've got to improve health status. We have a program at, at, at Florida Hospital Adventist Health System called Creation Health. Creation Health takes eight principles of health, and each of those stands for one of those, each of the letters in the word, in the, uh, word creation, stands for one of the health principles. 
And, and so, for example, the C in creation stands for choice. Remember when I talked about your part in, in, in getting the care that you need? So much of our health status is impacted by choices that we make. I shared with you that 75%, 75% of the chronic diseases that we suffer from in this society are because of choices that we have made. And yet, if we can't get a pill to reverse something that has come about because of years of neglect on our part, we get angry or upset about it. And so candidly, I hope that if you're interested in prevention, that you give us an opportunity through the Creation Health Program. And we're right now working with clergy and the various various parishes in the community to offer this through the churches in our in our community. But if there's enough public interest, we would be willing to start Creation Health classes that help people make better choices, help them be aware of some of those issues that will help them improve their health status. For both uh, fire and police, um, it's there are two questions here, but you probably put it all together. What are the top three needs, um, and could you speak to manpower within the answer? So when you when you talk about the top three needs, obviously the fire department, uh, like I described earlier, we are talking about surveying the community, talking about our five-year plan uh, for our needs now. The immediate needs that, that I look when I when I look at the landscape of our fire service that we have in New Summer right now, one of the uh, issues that always comes up is uh, manpower. Obviously, putting out a house fire or a building fire requires significant manpower. So, getting the right number of people to arrive on scene quickly within those first four or five six minutes is a significant benefit to the fire department and the homeowners. Uh, so obviously, that is a concern when I look at the entire the entirety of the fire department. Another issue that we've really come really recently into finding a real need for is the fact that we need to be able to get these people to the hospital, whether it's to create a new program or, or to improve all the program we have where, where we can transport in, in the the absence of evac ambulance, or if evac ambulance can increase their model, improve their model to allow us to get people to the hospital. Uh, that's a that's a very acute um, incident that's happening right now. We're talking about the last three, three or four years, uh, the lack of ambulance within Volusia County. And part of that is due to staffing on their part. The other part is overutilization of 911. When people are calling 911, and this is my third, uh, when people are calling 911 for things that are not, uh, not true emergencies, it creates a burden on every part of the EMS system. If I am taking, if I am calling because I have pink eye to go to the hospital, I am stealing an ambulance from Deltona or Daytona or Delano. So it, it, it cascades, it has a it has a countywide impact when, when 911 is overutilized for non emergency calls in the EMS call. Thank you. I want to pass that to the police chief. Our needs in order of importance are people, people, and people. Um, we have uh, 53 authorized sworn positions right now and I'm sitting on about 12 vacancies. Um, so I think that the city has done very well in um, giving us authorized positions. Uh, we just can't fill them. The reason that we can't fill them uh, is, is many. The reasons are many. Um, you know, the national narrative out there for being a police officer right now really isn't great. Um, we own some of that. And I say we as in, as in law enforcement administrators, we own some of that. So we're working hard to change that. But there's not too many folks out there right now when, when the economy is as good as it is who are looking to come work 12-hour um, shifts, nights, weekends, holidays, birthdays, Christmases, 
you know, you name it, these, these guys and gals are out here working um, while everybody else is asleep. And to do that for what law enforcement officers get paid around the country is very difficult. So uh, for our folks here, um, they're in contract negotiations right now with the city. And I believe that the, the city is, is negotiating in good faith. And they are going to present a package that will significantly help our officers uh, improve their quality of life. Uh, it's very important to me that our officers are taken care of. So, for the people that are watching on social media, <laughs> www.cityofnsb.com, please go to our HR department, fill out an application. Uh, we're looking for a very specific kind of person to be an officer here in New Smyrna. Most important thing for me is your character traits. Are you a person of good integrity, good moral character? Uh, I can teach you how to be a police officer. Uh, I can't teach you how to be a good person. So what we're looking for are people who interact well, who have a good background, who want to come and help people. I know that you know for, for folks out here in the law enforcement community that you know, when you sit down in front of an interview with somebody and you say, why do you want to be a police officer? And you say, I want to help people. Well kind of a corny answer, but it's the real answer. It's the answer I'm looking for. So there's a freebie to the, uh, the interview question there. I'm looking for you to help people, because if you don't have that in your heart, then you're not gonna be good at this job. I've got a foolproof methodology to find out if you're gonna be good at this job, and if I look a young candidate in the eye and say you're gonna be nothing but a public servant, if they don't do anything but say thank you or I really appreciate that, you're not gonna be good at this job. That's what we are, we're a public servant. And you need to be okay with that. So we are looking for people who wanna come and do this job the way that everybody that you see out here is doing it. Uh, so if you know anybody, call me. <laughs> Hang on to that microphone, Chief. You have a Facebook Live question. Oh, Chico. Look into the camera. <laughs> Too close, too close. Yeah. <laughs> News Murphy Twist from it. Tell us about increasing litter citations. Litter citations? That's the question. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that we're talking about people who are driving down the road and just toss things out of the, the, the car because that's normally when, when I see littering, that's what it is. And uh, I'm sorry? Well, the beach is littered. Brian, where are you at? Raise your hand. We've got one of our, our beach safety officers here, and uh, he can tell you about the beach. Because we've got this imaginary line that's kind of drawn in the sand. And if you're on the hard top side of that, you pop it up. Brian, you can look at those beach. Uh, I, I know that the folks that, that work down on the beach and uh, that do the, the cleanups down there, I think they do a fantastic job. Uh, we have some volunteer groups that also get out there and, and do beach cleanups, and I think they're wonderful people. Uh, so I'm going to limit the, what I'm, my answer to the hard top. Uh, when we see people littering out of vehicles or whatever, I promise you that they're going to get stopped, and they're probably going to get a citation. Um, it's a pet peeve of mine. Um, People wouldn't throw stuff down in their house or their yard or uh, But mo most normal people wouldn't throw things down in their house or treat their house like that. So please don't treat our city like that. Uh, we want our city to be clean and it's very important. Um, you know, the broken windows theory of policing is, is if you have a, a broken window in a building and you don't fix it, then it sends the message to the public that you just can break more windows. Um, so the same thing here in New Smyrna. Uh, if we see someone that is littering, uh, I'm going to address that immediately. Me as chief, if I see that, I'm going to address it immediately because it's just another way we, we have to tell people don't, don't treat this more that way. We're proud of, of our city and we don't want that. Our Facebook commenter said the beach and the parking lots. Clarify your question. <laughs> the parking lots? <laughs> parking lots, like Fly the Lot, I would assume, 27. So everybody can hear that Facebook Live comment responding said uh, the beach and parking lots. Right. Uh, well, the, part of the answer to the parking lot uh, part of that is the same as, as what I just described. If we see that happening, we're going to address it immediately. Uh, I don't know if the parking ambassadors are, are, are doing that uh, because they're so busy writing parking citations, but uh, I, I would hope that all of our officers, and, and they're listening to me now, um, <laughs> littering is unacceptable. Thank you. And this is 
This is for police and fire. If you want to go ahead and answer any of your station's plan, police and or fire. Any what plan? New stations. No. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to our, our five year strategic plan, I had discussions with uh, city staff uh, really recently, and a lot of talk is about not necessarily a new fire station or replacing an existing fire station, but to to help put a an additional fire station when the when the demand grows to put one in a area that's beneficial to that community. So yeah, you know, it's on our radar. It's not happening uh, anytime soon, but it is our it is. Part of our plan is to look at where is the growth, where is the need. Uh, a lot of our need is not as much geographic as it is demographic. So you have a population that may be young and healthy and not doing, not needing the service that other communities or demographics need. So we have to evaluate the area, find out if if it's warranted, and I imagine at some point it will be, but and find out when that will materialize. Thank you. I want to uh, pass the microphone to Ken Madison. Does the hospital have a certified geriatric specialist? Gerontology is an important service. My private physician is a gerontologist, but she just moved to Panama. <laughs> so honestly, it's, it's on our recruiting list Internal medicine is, of course, an important part of what we do, but I am not aware of board-certified gerontologists on our staff right now. I may be wrong, though, and I am reminded of that often. Thank you. Do the new pedestrian crosswalks on South Atlantic improve safety? And there's there were two question cards about crosswalks. Do you just want to yep. kind of take that whole topic and sure. address? Go ahead. Why not? Why don't you start? If you don't catch it out, I will uh, okay. give you more questions, more details. The pedestrian crosswalks on South Atlantic are, are important, but I consider them to be a half-finished job. Um, Commissioner Sachs has uh, spearheaded the working with the county. Uh, to partner and have all of those crosswalks signalized, for lack of a better term, where they have the flashing beacons or whatever it is that, that, that legally that we can put out there. Uh, I think that's a good idea and it should be for every one of those crosswalks there. Um, the, for me, the, the responsibility for the safety of that belongs with everybody, both the drivers and the pedestrians, the bicyclists that are in that area. Uh, those lights, I think, will help but they're not a cure-all. So uh, we work in the police department to create a culture of safety um, down in those crosswalks. We've had numerous uh, undercover violations uh, that we've worked out there. Uh, Lieutenant Severance and uh, Lieutenant Rail over here have posed as Beach Boys and have uh, <laughs> gotten in their board shorts and their hats and walked across the street and when somebody doesn't stop and the rest of us come out there and we write ourselves a little citation or two. <laughs> Works very well. Um, and in some cases, you know, because they're a little bit older, then we could probably get them for abusing the elderly. Thanks. Did that, did that cover the uh, both of them? The only other comment, can you address maybe um, lower speed limits? Is that a possibility? Um, lower speed limits. This is a, a consistent question that I get all the time because folks think their cars are driving too fast in their neighborhood. There are only really two ways that you can legally set a, uh, a speed limit in our state. And they're both con uh, controlled by the Man Manual for Uniform Traffic Control. I think that's what it is. Um, they're either set by statute, and most of you know that if there's not a um, speed limit sign in a residential neighborhood, the speed limit is what? 30 miles an hour. Um, the minimum speed limit that you can have here in the state of Florida is 20 miles an hour. You can't go any lower than that, legally. The other way that we set speed limits uh, and that they're evaluated are through speed studies. And we routinely conduct those in, in various places around the city. And what we look for is the 85th percentile speed, uh, which says that, you know, again, like 
most people are good people. All they want to do is get from point A to point B in the quickest and safest manner possible. So when we have, say, 5,000 cars that travel a particular roadway over a period of a week, we measure all those speeds. And people don't know we're measuring them because they're like little lines that are in, in, the, in the roadway, little um, tubes that are out there. And uh, we look at the fastest vehicles, slowest vehicles, but that 85th percentile really is the speed at which most people travel to get safely from point A to point B, and that sets what a speed limit should be. Uh, most of the time that is very close to what the speed limit is set to on a roadway. Uh, a I've very rarely seen it go under that, the 85th percentile. Uh, sometimes it goes slightly over that, and then at that point really what we should be doing is evaluating what the speed limit is on that road and probably adjusting it upward to artificially lower the speed limit or to place stop signs in areas where they're not supported by traffic engineering studies. Uh, actually contributes to uh, the problem. Uh, people will drive through stop signs uh, because they feel like they're being artificially slowed down. They will then violate speed limits that are artificially too low and it just creates more of a problem. So we try to stay with what is scientifically proven to be accurate and uh, enforceable. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Does the hospital practice drills for potential as dangerous threatening visitors' patients? Um, and there was a specific example, hazardous material spill. Is that a practice? Yes. Uh, our emergency response preparedness requires us periodically to uh, conduct a drill. Uh, we work with, uh, with uh, local agencies, county agencies, uh, we actually even do drills amongst hospitals as we focus on making sure that we're prepared in case of an emergency to be able to respond appropriately. Very good. You want to clarify that too? We do. We do. We partner with with the uh, Florida Hospital, and and we they actually bring us in on on occasion, brought us in to help um, if they're changing a plan or adjusting a plan to have us weigh in on weigh in on it and see if it fits our, our needs or our capabilities as well. But yeah, we definitely partner with them and uh, when it comes to emergency preparedness or uh, response to something internal, yes, yeah, we definitely partner up with the for the hospital. Okay, how's that, Mike? Yeah. Um, what are the top three hazard risk analysis occurrences that affect our community? Uh, top three, uh, obviously, like uh, Ken had said from the hospital, um, cardiac events, heart, heart disease, things like that. That is a that is probably our number one response within the city is a cardiac or heart disease event. Uh, second being motor vehicle accidents. Um, I don't think that there's a day that goes by where there's not at least two or three accidents in the, in the city. Oh yeah, um, at least at least. And and I don't even get involved in all of them. The police department gets involved in every single one of them. Uh, we only respond to the ones where there are reports of injuries and, or road hazards and things like that. So, uh, heart disease, motor vehicle accidents, and I need three, huh? <laughs> okay, how about we let them off the hook with the third, and then we'll follow up with um, multiple question cards. Okay. They were asking specifically, are you able to respond to a brain plane in the airport? We are. We have a. We have a. But we have some training that, that we that we coordinate with the airport every year. Uh, we do annual training with them. We can respond out there. We can uh, dispense foam onto the burning aircraft to uh, help suppress some of the fumes, the vapors that come up from the fuel that that obviously is going to leak from the plane. But we do have the ability to respond to plane crash incidents on or off the airport. And she, he said you guys show up to every single incident. Is that an incident that you, your folks will show up to as well? Okay. okay, fire chief. Are adequate multiple exit and entrances provided for gated communities? That's a good question. And fire trucks in and out, ambulance, etc. Yes, absolutely. Every every development, every plan, every everything that comes through the city of New Smyrna for approval gets reviewed by the fire department through the fire manual. When we're talking about site review or land development review, 
we weigh in and we, we make sure that the appropriate number of exit entrances are there, the appropriate radiuses for the turns are there to allow for our, our bigger truck to go through there. There's a program that the engineers actually put in their, their drawings through called auto turn, and it addresses things like uh, radiuses of turns, making cul-de-sacs appropriately sized. So yeah, obviously, anytime there's a plan that's reviewed by the city of New Orleans, uh, it is reviewed also by the fire department for things like that. Thank you. I'm going to pass that to the police chief. Um, two questions, somewhat the same, about um, how does a citizen find out about events happening in the city? One of the questions um, on the beach side, business owner, uh, I'd like to have current advisories of issues happening on the beach side, car break-ins, room break-ins, credit card fraud. And then the other question, similar question, what type of regular crime reporting can you share with the public? Are there things such as that? The, uh, all police departments, all across all police departments, sheriff's offices, every law enforcement agency across the country is measured um, by the Uniform Crime Report. Uh, it's tracked by the FBI. Uh, there are seven crimes that are, that are consistently tracked over the last gajillion years. Uh, murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, uh, those are your, your crimes of passion. Then you have uh, burglary, theft, and motor vehicle theft. So you have seven there total that, that they track consistently. And that's how all police departments are measured. So when we talk about what our um, mission statement is, Lieutenant Riggle, what's our mission statement? Oh. <laughs> you got a cheap look? <laughs> <laughs> okay, our, our mission statement is to reduce crime and improve the quality of life. So, and, and the translation of that is reducing crime. We're measured by that uniform crime report. So, when I get on Sergeant Kirk, Kirk all the time uh, and ask him what's our clearance rate on, on our crime, which is also a track, you know, he and I are, are always talking about this. We're talking about where we are on our crimes that we can control, which are burglary, theft, and motor vehicle theft. Uh, when we talk about quality of life crimes, they're also tracked on that website. You can go to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement website and they will um, give you a report on every agency out there, uh, all in the state of Florida. You can, you can look at our crime stats from years past and see where we fall up and down. And uh, all that information is available for you to look at. So the, the quality of life crimes, when you want to know how many shoplifting uh, crimes we've had, how many arrests we've had, all that information is there. You can also go to our webpage, the police department webpage, uh, cityofnsb.com, and go to the police department webpage, and you can look on there for our annual report for the last two years. And in that annual report, it will describe our, uh, the percentage change in those crimes, and it will let you know where we, you know, what types of calls for service we respond to. Uh, Sean was talking about crashes, it'll give you the top uh, 15 to 20 crash locations in the city. There's a lot of information in our annual report there, so go online and look at that. And, but as, as, as far as a daily or a weekly or a monthly, um, if, if a particular homeowners association wants to know something about their area, we, we would provide that to them on a public records request, uh, but we don't put out a daily intelligence or um, statistical product um, for the public. Uh, that's not because we don't want to, it's because we're so short-handed right now, we really don't have the people to do that. Can you follow, or uh, we'll just keep you with the microphone. How does a private individual, if someone Baker acted, is there, what is there, what is the procedure? Uh, a Baker Act is an involuntary commitment uh, for someone who is a danger to themselves or others and doesn't have the ability to recognize that and, and deal with it. So there's really only a couple of ways that you can uh, get a Baker Act, uh, actually three ways. You, uh, a medical doctor can do it, uh, a police officer can do it if those signs and symptoms are exhibited to a police officer in their presence, or you can have an ex parte order from a judge. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, that's the only three ways I want to learn. I always look out for them because they do this every day. And in, in the city of New Smyrna, surprisingly, we do a lot of Baker Act. I don't want to deal with it, but we do a lot. 
So if a, if a private citizen, to answer your question, if a private citizen wanted a Baker Act done, they, uh, if it's an immediate need, uh, obviously they can contact us and we will respond and make that evaluation. Um, but if it's not an immediate need, then that will probably have to be done through a ex parte hearing with a judge. Uh, we covered, uh, somebody asked a question about homelessness. Um, we did discuss that in our last CCR meeting, but if you just want to briefly touch on homelessness, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Somebody had asked about what uh, plans or actions in the community want to come about that. Do I want to talk about it or will I talk Will you just briefly <laughs> touch that since, okay. thank you. Uh, the homeless problem here in New Smyrna is certainly not what uh, our neighbors up in Daytona Beach or other parts of this county are experiencing. But we do have a homeless issue here. So uh, I get asked all the time, what are we doing about the homeless problem? Back in the early 90s, the city of Miami Beach uh, had an issue where they were addressing their homeless problem with uh, proactive law enforcement. Um, they were making arrests for uh, minor misdemeanor crimes, quality of life crimes, uh, they were removing property and generally making it difficult for homeless people to live and survive in and around the city of Miami. Um, a gentleman by the last name of Pottinger uh, took the city of Miami to court and sued them. And it went into <coughs> excuse me, the appellate courts. And an appellate judge uh, ruled that the city of Miami could no longer do that that there was multiple violations of uh, constitutional rights in play uh, in terms of uh, Fourth and Fifth Amendment violations of taking property uh, unlawfully, um, you know, not giving people due process. So this goes up through the appellate courts, comes back down. Uh, there's a settlement that's made in the uh, mid-90s, and the Pottinger ruling is still applicable today. So the Pottinger ruling basically says that uh, when you have uh, homeless people in public spaces, that you need a basically a come as you are shelter in order to offer homeless people an option other than a misdemeanor arrest for various crimes. And there's a, a whole list of crimes that we're talking about there, from uh, public camping to sleeping on uh, benches to um, uh, taking care of, of uh, personal things in, in public. The nicest way I can say it. Um, so, in this county, I know that most of you know that we are in the process of working with the county uh, to develop the first step shelter. Uh, if you've been reading it lately, they've uh, supposedly got a director or two that's going to be running that thing up there, and this is going to actually come about. The important part of the first step shelter is that it is going to be a Pottinger compliant shelter. That allows us, as law enforcement, to deal a little more effectively with those quality of life crimes that we see homeless folks sometimes make. That said, I personally believe that you cannot arrest your way out of homelessness. Uh, we work with various organizations in and around New Smyrna to assist the homeless and help them either improve their quality of life or return them to a better quality of life somewhere else. So it's very important to me uh, that our interaction with law enforcement and the homeless is a positive thing. Uh, there are a wealth of information, and I think that if you treat people well, no matter who they are, that it makes you a better police officer. So we will be working with uh, uh, the folks around here that, that are assisting the homeless, uh, the churches and civic groups, and we will continue to, to do that and use arrest as a last course of action. Thank you, sir. I'm going to pass that mic to Ken Madison. <laughs> Hospital tax. When does it expire in your mind? The agreement between the Adventist Health System and the taxing industry called for a reduction of tax by 10% over, I believe, seven or eight years. We're seeing the, the results of that each year with a lower amount of tax. 
that is available to pay for indigent care. Um, I don't believe the taxing district in the agreement that Adventist Health System signed with the tax district uh, eliminated the tax eventually. Um, I, I believe that it reverts to a minimal amount at the end of the seven or eight years. Uh, but I don't believe that I am, I can speak to the elimination of the tax. I know that we're working hard to lower cost of care so that we are less dependent on tax proceeds and we can absorb more indigent care uh, through better business practices and through uh, uh, higher uh, profitability even though the profits are plowed plow, plow right back into the hospital. So it's a, it's a great segue into the um, additional question about uh, emergency room costs. Are there measures to lower emergency room costs, or can you speak to that specifically within that? The emergency room is the most expensive place for people to try and access care. So, what I I don't want to come across as, as inappropriate, so don't, don't go out here saying Ken Madison told us we shouldn't use the emergency room. If you need an emergency room, we want to be there for you. But the fact that we operate an emergency room means that we must staff it, we must equip it in such a way that we can handle the life emergencies that people are having. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that is an expensive proposition no matter where you go. I believe that over time, better access to care for the community helps to lower the abuse of the emergency department. But I don't see a way that, because we never want to compromise care. I'm not going to tell you, you know, we, we probably could not have the CT scanner on after 7 o'clock at night. We could, we could save money by sending that technician home and, and, and save the electric. No, I mean, we're a 24-7. And I don't know how to appropriately share with people that the emergency room won't be expensive when you access it. But what I will encourage you to do is establish a relationship with your primary care doctor, use the primary care doctor for the care that you might need, especially routine and chronic care. Utilize urgent care centers when that's appropriate and think of the emergency room truly as that place where if you need emergency care, there are gonna be men and women who are dedicated to saving your life and doing the very best they can uh, to preserve life. And that probably isn't the answer that you were looking for. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. The chief would say, I believe what Mr. Madison meant to say. <laughs> so, uh, Chief Panamar, Couple of questions about 911. Um, you want to talk about the fire department. The questions are how is a call handled when I dial 911? Response times. Um, you know, are you 24 hours a day? Can you, can you kind of talk about that whole process for the fire department? Absolutely. Just like just like the police department and the hospital are available 24 hours a day, so so is the fire department. They the staffing at noon is the same as the staffing at midnight. There's no increase or decrease of the available uh, people who, to respond to your call. Doesn't matter day or night, holidays, um, school functions, it doesn't, none of that stuff matters. There, there's the same number of people there to respond to your calls, day and night, 365 days a year. When you call 911 and you activate the emergency response system, you talk, when you pick up the phone, you immediately go to Central Dispatch, which is over in Daytona. It's run by Volusia County. They determine at that point, is it an EMS call, is it a fire call, is it a police department call, is it none of the above, and then they have to figure out what, what bucket to put it in. When they determine where it's supposed to go, they go through a series of questions. If it's an EMS call or a fire call, they determine what level of care they need through a program called EMD, they actually go through 
various medical questions, and can that kind of narrow down, is this a true emergency, is it a lower priority emergency, or something that we're just going to send the fire department to go check it out, and then if we need an ambulance, they will, the fire department will activate the ambulance from that point. So just by dialing 911 does not automatically give you a, a, an ALS fire truck and an ambulance. They do prioritize the calls through a series of questions, um, and they go about it that way. In addition to that, just riding in an ambulance to the hospital does not, not immediately or automatically mean that you're going to one of your 19 beds in the hospital. We have patients who, through whether it's intentional abuse or just a misunderstanding of the system, believe that if you are to hop in the back of an ambulance and get a ride to the hospital, you are going to get faster, better care. And that's not at all true. The hospital will, will and has taken a patient off of our ambulance stretcher and put them in the lobby or the waiting room just like every other patient. And they do that through medical triage. They do not just arbitrarily throw people in the lobby or the waiting area. I don't know what the proper term is for, for, the, for the lobby waiting area. But they do triage. They evaluate the patient and they determine whether it's a true emergency or if it can be delayed. And, and by doing that, it allows for the more critical, the more life-threatening uh, patients to get the proper care that they need. So yeah, riding, riding an ambulance to the hospital does not guarantee that you're going to one of his 19 beds or any of the other ones up in Fort Orange, Arizona. So. Thanks, can you talk about um, emergency alert systems? Do we, you know, locally, um, has an app with emergency alerts, maybe you have a city, does notifications for emergency alerts? So Volusia County uh, manages emergency management for the entire county. Um, each city falls underneath that umbrella and kind of manages their local emergencies. We, the best avenue for you as an individual is to get on the Volusia County um, app and download their application and they'll be able to do their emergency alerts through your phone. It's live and they can do things such as weather, like we're having tonight, um, Amber Alerts will, will come across there if that's one of the settings that you want to have, the Silver Alert, another one. Um, there's also a thing that we can employ for wildfires, um, hazardous materials, active shooters even, called Reverse 911. And what our, the fire department, police department, incident commanders, when they, when they get to an incident and realize this thing is bigger than a small, one or two person incident. This is affecting an entire neighborhood, whether it's chemical spill or wildfire or people running around actively shooting up a, a, a school. They can activate reverse 911, which will notify all the residents and cell phones in that that are attributed to that neighborhood. So you can be aware that there is a there is a potential to either shelter in place in the in the event of a chemical emergency or the need to evacuate uh, if if that were the case. Do we need to opt in on the reverse 911? No, that's something the reverse 911 you don't. Providers? The reverse 911 you do not need to opt in on. That's that's a uh, automatic function of the of the uh, emergency management system in Volusia County. Another um, avenue that you have to, to help stay in touch with the city, especially during hurricane season, um, is Facebook. And I even if you are not a Facebook person, you should at least create a Facebook account and get, get in touch with the police department, get in touch with the city of New Smyrna Beach Fire Department, and get in touch with the city of New Smyrna. Make them part of your friend group, for those of you who aren't familiar, make them part of your friend group. During a hurricane, for example, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of, of data that get sent out through Facebook. And Anna, Anna keeps her Facebook through the city up to date on every occurrence that's going on when we have road closures, flooding, things like that, all of that stuff, the police department, fire department, and Anna can, can, that is her outlet to get to you quickly. And that's probably one of our quickest uh, methods to get information out, because we can do it instantaneously. I'm so glad you said that, Chief. And I'm just gonna reiterate the importance of that. Um, <laughs> in, in hurricanes, 
that is the fastest way to get information. And when they're, everyone has the same questions um, preparing for a hurricane. Where are the sandbags? Are there still sandbags? And the most up to the minute information is going to be on Facebook. If you struggle with Facebook, you don't know how to get on it, but that's important enough to you, I will help you create a page that's that important during emergencies. Um, this person specifically asked about tornado warnings. Do we do sirens? Do we do tornado sirens? No, there are, there are no sirens anywhere in Volusia County that I'm aware of. Uh, there are no tornado sirens. Your best, your best bet for that is either to, um, one, get the Volusia County Emergency Management app on your phone. That's pretty active. And then a weather radio. I know it, it, in, in 2018, we're still talking about a radio. But a weather radio is probably one of the quickest and most um, readily available means to get emergency emergency uh, notifications such as tornado. Uh, if you're not, if you're away from your emergency weather radio, then obviously the Volusia County Emergency Management app is your next best bet. Thank you very much. Um, back to the chief, Chief Coffin. Um, traffic. Getting to the beach and beachside, why are golf carts allowed to drive on the roads? I don't like that question. Can we go to the next Sure, one? why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, first off, golf carts. Uh, everybody sees golf carts riding around, but there's a distinct difference. Golf carts are not allowed anywhere here in New Smyrna. So the only place that you would be allowed to run a true golf cart is if you lived over off of um, by one of the golf courses over there and, and you were going straight from your home and you were going to cross the street and go down a little bit to the golf course and come right back. What you're seeing running up and down the streets are what the state calls low-speed vehicles and they are regulated. Uh, there has to be certain safety equipment on them, uh, they have to be tagged, they have to be a licensed driver, uh, so there are restrictions involved in those vehicles. There are also restrictions involved of where they can travel within the city. They cannot go on any street with a speed limit of more than 35 miles an hour. So, there are certain streets that they can go in order to get around the city. So, Saxon is one of those streets where they can go out and drive up and down the street. The maximum speed allowed for these low speed vehicles is 20 miles an hour. So you can imagine the issues that we have with folks who live on Saxon or uh, some of these other streets where you've got a 20 mile an hour vehicle holding up traffic that wants to go 35. And it's on a no passing zone the entire length of the roadway. So we do have issues with low speed vehicles. There's not much I can do about low speed vehicles. <laughs> other than address the ones that are driving in areas they should not be driving in, or uh, unlicensed drivers. Sometimes we'll find uh, young kids driving these vehicles, especially the rentals, and, and we'll address that at the time. They're not allowed anywhere on South Atlantic, although we occasionally see them down there. Uh, there are portions of the North Causeway that they're not supposed to be traveling, although there is a way that you can get from Riverside over to the beach side if you follow the little map. And, uh, we can make that available to you if you have a low-speed vehicle that you want to make that, that track, but a little bit out of the way. Hope that answered the question. Thank you. Um, and I understand code enforcement is part of your responsibility. How does that work? What are the benefits to, of this new responsibility? And what are the challenges that you face? Working fabulously. <laughs> I love code enforcement. <laughs> uh, the police department took over code enforcement. Uh, I actually asked for it. Uh, I think it's, it should be part of what we're doing there uh, in the police department. So we inherited uh, two code enforcement officers, uh, an administrative person, and an animal control officer. And we just inherited them early this year. So we're working through um, assimilating them into the police department and buying into our thought process of uh, do it now instead of do it later and uh, getting them focused on what we feel is important in code enforcement. Code enforcement in this city, in any city, serves a very important function. Again, I'm gonna go back to the broken windows theory. 
when you have junk cars and you have garbage and you have all kinds of things that in residential or business areas, it detracts from what we want this city to look like. So code enforcement function, whether it be that or uh, dealing with short-term rentals or any number of things that code enforcement uh, deals with, uh, it, it's very important to the city. So we're happy to have that. And you also have the domestic abuse advocate reports in the police department, correct? So many have asked who does that person report to? We have two victim advocates. Victim advocates. In the city. Uh, they don't deal with just domestic violence. Uh, they deal with all types of crime. Uh, again, uh, they have been recognized multiple times for their excellent work in helping victims of crime. Um, both Debbie and Robbie. Robbie, where are you at? I thought I saw you earlier. Okay, no Robbie. Um, both of these ladies work extremely hard to help victims. They go above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, they will go and sit with folks in courtrooms. Uh, they will hold their hands. They will get them uh, temporary emergency shelter. There's a number of things that our victim advocates do. Uh, they work for Sergeant Kirk in the Detective Bureau, and they do a great job. Thank you. We're going to take a few more questions for these gentlemen, then we'll let you guys do some closing remarks, okay? Okay, thank you. Ken Madison, this is a Facebook question. Have you observed the emerging trend of people using Uber to get to the emergency room to avoid ambulance delays and fees here in Houston on the beach? Anyone heard of that? I don't think I have observed a Uber proliferation. <laughs> Chief Vandermark, any, have you heard of this? <laughs> uh, most recently I heard of it uh, occurring in Orlando. Orlando actually was on the news recently, um, not advocating the program by any means. They were actually saying that this is detrimental to patient care. Um, I'm not so bold as to say it's detrimental to patient care. I am saying publicly, if you choose to use Uber to go to the hospital, make sure you don't have a life-threatening illness. The, the reason why the ambulance and the fire department exist and provide excellent advanced life support care is because we're there to help you and we're, we are more than happy to enter your 911 call and render aid and get you to the hospital. So if you choose to use Uber or Lyft, to be fair, um, to get to the hospital, you better make sure you're not, you're not gonna die between here and there. So. Okay, kind of stole the hospital thunder, so you have to give that back to them. Thank you very much. Um, why don't we raise the hospital generators so they don't have to evacuate? Why don't we what? Raise the hospital generators so they don't have to evacuate. <laughs> because there's other infrastructure like oxygen tanks and other things. I, I happen to mention. These guys have done a really nice job by standing out here and being closer to you than I've been standing out right here. There's more in the infrastructure that would need to be hardened or raised than just the generators, but you're right. A solution could be to raise the generators, but I'm not sure that that would be enough to convince me that evacuation wasn't the right call if I felt our patients would be in danger. Isn't a commercial generator like enormous? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, they're not like them. your generators at home. I mean, that's correct. Enormous. It's a huge undertaking. It, absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, last one about hospital. It seems dementia and Alzheimer's is epidemic, not limited to 80s and 90s. It's happening in the 60s and younger. What services do you have for that? For them? Alzheimer's is actually number six on the leading causes of death in the United States. Fifteen years ago, my father died of Alzheimer's, and uh, it's, a, it's a tragic, tragic, tragic disease. Mental health is underserved everywhere in this country. Um, and candidly, um, that is something that Florida Hospital is focused on right now in our strategic planning initiatives. We believe that if we are to truly meet the needs of the community, we've got to include a mental health component 
more actively in our planning process. It is underrepresented today in healthcare, and it is something, candidly, having personally gone through that with my father, uh, resources that are available to help are, uh, are woefully inadequate. Thank you. Uh, Chief Vandemark, hazmat spill on I-95. How, how would we handle that, and how would we, could we evacuate, how would we evacuate Something for you? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, two of our main thoroughfares for hazardous materials, and it, it's one that we that we pre-plan and we and we tabletop and we talk about all the time. We have the I-95 corridor and we have the rail the railroad. Those two things are main arteries for these large tankers. To that end, we partner with the Lucia County Hazmat Team. Uh, to respond to those emergencies. I have, within our fire department, I have nine, no, I have ten has, hazardous materials technicians. Those people, those individuals, can respond to any spill out there. Um, they put on the appropriate hazardous material suit. Uh, we've established a whole support corridor, and then they go in and they can go in and patch leaks on rail cars, uh, over-the-road vehicles, uh, tankers, that, things of that nature. So when we talk about spills on 95, obviously one of the big impacts we saw most recently with the wildfire is if we are going to shut down 95, and that is when the city of New Smyrna Beach is going to see the impact of shutting down an interstate highway. Because when they when we shut it down to, to mitigate the spill, which could take hours, and by hours I mean 12, 14, 16 hours to mitigate a spill. Um, those vehicles have to go somewhere. They don't stop coming up from Miami or down from Georgia. They keep on coming. And so we're gonna funnel, we're gonna, we're gonna funnel them through this one beach, through Edgewater, Fort Orange, like we did through the most recent wildfire. Um, but we have, with the partnership with Volusia County, we have the ability to, to patch, clean up, and do all those things to help minimize that impact. Reduce the time that we have to close down the roadway or reduce the time that that rail car is leaking fumes or, or liquid onto the community. Uh, back to the reverse 911, obviously if we had a hazardous material spill, uh, we could activate the reverse 911 and evacuate the neighborhoods if it were necessary. Um, there's not the methyl ethyl bad stuff coming through on the rail cars that you think is coming through here right now. Um, there are volatile chemicals on there, but it is not the most toxic, deadly stuff that we that is available on the market. So there is a there is a great degree of comfort in knowing as much as I do about hazardous materials about what comes through town, and, and I don't lose sleep over it uh, because I know it's not the most volatile chemical out there. I know I have the right people in the job who can fix it if it if it does come out of the container. Thank you very much. So there's about 10 cards that we still have questions. I will facilitate getting uh, your questions to the proper person to get those answers to you. Give me maybe a week to make sure all of that facilitation happens. I'm gonna let these gentlemen say good night and have some closing words. Good night. So um, again, I just wanna thank everybody for coming out. I, I have been, my entire adult life has been dedicated to public safety. It's all I've ever really done or wanted to do. Um, so I, I take it as a great, great honor to be able to be trusted uh, by all of you to be in, in this service, to be in charge of this fire department, to be trusted that I am going to be the right decision maker to protect and keep your family safe. I, I humbly uh, take that as a, as a very, big honor, um, and I am available to each and every one of you for anything uh, that you may want to discuss. Uh, my email is on the website, um, city of, Smyrna, or city of .com. If you want to reach out to me, please do. Uh, I'll get right back to you, and uh, we'll, we can definitely discuss anything you guys, you guys might come up with beyond what we talked about tonight. So thank you very much. Mission of Florida Hospital News for is a faith-based.
His mission is to extend the healing ministry of Christ. Our purpose is not to convert people to a particular religion, but our purpose is to honor God through the care that we provide our community. We take that seriously. I believe that for me to be able to honor God through my leadership, I must continue to focus on how are we providing care that does honor God. That's my commitment to you. I've been with this company, Adventist Health System, the parent company, for 42 years, and I still have a few years left in me. And as long as I have breath, I will continue to focus on your needs, meeting them adequately, and making sure that I operate a facility that at its core honors God. I want to thank all y'all for coming out here tonight. Uh, I know the weather's kind of crappy, so uh, it's not easy to get out in the rain and come out and listen to us talk, but I think it's important uh, that we have that interaction. Um, very much thank the police department staff that are here tonight uh, that represent us every day and do a fabulous job doing that. Uh, thank you to the uh, social media folks that are, that are watching and that submitted the questions for us to answer. I really want to hear what y'all want your police department to look like. I want to hear what you have to say, and I want to hear your suggestions. So go to the webpage and email me. Uh, there, there's, just click on uh, the link to email me, and I'll get every email, and I promise you I will get back to you. Uh, your suggestions, I got one suggestion tonight that I'm going to seriously consider uh, from my good friend Herb here, uh, and I'm going to make a little change to the way we do our business. So I, I very much appreciate that. I don't blow off any of those suggestions whatsoever. The last thing I'm going to tell you before we close tonight, and it's the most important thing that I think all the officers here want me to say to you, is lock your dang car door. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Kim says lock your hands. That's the second most important thing. Lock your car door. Stop leaving your laptop in plain sight. Don't put your gun in the glove compartment. And for God's sakes, don't put your keys in a, in a car. <laughs> if, if everybody in New Smyrna would just do that one thing, it would cut our burglaries in half. Uh, it's ridiculous. Same thing on your home. When you leave your home, lock your home. I know you live in New Smyrna. It's a great place to live. But this isn't 1965. Uh, you got to lock your stuff up or people are going to steal it. So please help us by locking your stuff up. Thank you. Thank you.